feel from a medical standpoint, and, and I hate to use the word suffering, but we're always worried about pets suffering in their last hours, etc. And and honestly, that's an excuse I do use for clients who always say they just want their pet to pass at home. And I know the disease process is going to be bad the last few hours, but how do you bring up that discussion? You know, it's, it's the thing that everybody says, right? Just, just as you say, they, they say, I just don't want my pet to suffer. That's always a thing. So then I, I talk them through what really suffering is because we have a broad definition of it. And I looked it up in the medical dictionaries when I first started. I'm like, everyone is using this word and I cannot find it in my textbooks. <laughs> there is no definition on what this is. You know, there's different definitions from anything that, that, um, anything that denies you your true self. And then um, anything that doesn't allow you to do the, th the things that you want to do. Like there are these broad definitions. But what I, the definition that I use with my families is, as I say, to me, suffering is the inability to think or do anything other than address the pain that you're in. Mm. And that can be physical pain or mental pain. Because to me, an animal that is in a crate that has thunderstorm anxiety, I'm from Florida, so we get thunderstorms all the time. Yeah. I've seen dogs just bust out of, of wire crates. And they're coming out with, they're, they're bloody. I mean, you watch a dog that doesn't want to go into a veterinary clinic. They are scared to death. Yeah. That is absolute form of suffering because they can't do or think anything other than address the pain they're in. Same thing with the dog that's lying on his side, unable to breathe. That's suffering to me. Now, that is different. The, the, the little Yorkie with congested heart, congested heart failure is going to experience a different suffering than the large Labrador that can't get up and walk around anymore from advanced arthritis. So then I go... And I ask the family, what do you want? And so if the little Yorkie with congestive heart failure says, I really want him to die naturally, you know, I go through the conversation of your Yorkie isn't natural, <laughs> right? Like our Yorkie, your bulldog isn't natural. Like there's nothing natural about what we've done to these genetic beings now that, that we have in our lives. So if you want a natural death, it's outside in the wild at five or six years of age and a lion's going to come and get them when they're not contributing to the pack anymore. But a nat that lion isn't going to decide between the gazelle that is cognitively capable of making decisions and happy when his owner comes and the, the gazelle that is not cognitively capable and is lying there, you know, uh, unable to move around. And I'm going to choose that one. You know, that that's not how Mother Nature works. So we have the responsibility to step in and say, what do we feel is best? Right. And I don't like even saying the word right. What's the right decision? I rarely say that. Because, it's, and, and you know, as a veterinarian, we, we hear our doctors say all the time, go home, call me when you're ready. Or you are making the right decision. I don't, my clients don't know when it's time. They don't practice veterinary medicine. They don't know when it's the right time. So instead of saying you are making the right decision, I always say we together are making the best decision. So if you want your Yorkie to, to die of natural causes, let me explain to you what that looks like because you might call me at two o'clock in the morning at the emergency clinic and I'm telling you, that's not peaceful. So if you would like peace above all, which is what I deliver, then let's, let, me, let me tell you what medically that looks like and what we can do and what we can't do. Because that's okay. I, I got to tell you, I'm blown away here because <laughs> – so you mentioned that you just graduated seven years ago. So I've been in practice twice as long as you. And you have this it, – it's clearly not your age, but you have this this – overly wise sense about this whole process and and the wording you're using about discussing end of life the wording you're using about hospice care it just it's it's you're you're an outlier you're just a statistical outlier and i'm blown away by this i'm just i'm sitting here that thinking that if you came into anyone any one of my clients homes you would just you'd have them you'd have them on the on the right on where you, where you need to talk about this stuff. So I'm glad you're actually lecturing about this stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think there's a lot of people who are going to benefit from from what you're saying, but you have this you have this unique view of this whole situation. Oh, thank you. But that's all I have. Don't ask me about antibiotics. <laughs> <laughs> that, what is the vaccine schedule for a ferret? <laughs> <laughs> I would say go call your veterinarian. <laughs> I do not know that, but I, I love this stuff so much. I'm, I'm actually becoming a volunteer in human hospice to sit with, in, in my area again, to sit with people that are dying. Because I really believe in people that don't have other family members. I mean, the, it, is, it is this gift that we have that we're so scared about talking about. We're not, you're not, you know, we're, we aren't taught it in veterinary school. No, not, not only right. that, but we're the only medical profession licensed to take a life. The only one, even it, you can 
some people are probably saying, you know, well, humans, we can do it some states. There are six states where it's legal, but the, the person administers it themselves. It's not me as a doctor going and euthanizing a family member. And that's what we do. We're the only medical profession licensed to do it, and we're not taught. The, just like you said, the words are so specific, what you say and what you don't say. Yeah, communication, just, communication is huge. Yeah, and I'll give you an example too. So when 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 I'm actually going through the euthanasia process, you know, um, I I was taught that you prepare the family and you warn them and you say something like, "I'm going to warn you that his eyes aren't going to close and this might happen and that might happen." And I remember sitting there with people. I'm like, "This just doesn't land for me. It's not it's not coming out of my mouth properly." And so then what I what now what I say is the two things I'm going to prepare you for because it's not warn. I'm, literally priming them for a negative when I warn them about something. Two things I'll prepare you for is that his eyes aren't going to close all the way and his bladder might relax. And if anything else happens, I'll explain at that time. You know, literally, if anything else happens, I will tell you. And if there's a little bit of a movement or, you know, a little twitching or anything, I can just put my hand on their hand at that moment, at that moment. Wow. This, wow. Is, very, this is very normal. Death is a phase. It's not a, pro it's, it's not a moment. It's a phase. Wow. Thanks for watching. If you liked what you saw, don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. You can listen every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. to Your Pet Matters on 107.7 The Bronx with me. If you missed that, we're podcasting on iTunes. All you have to do is search under Your Pet Matters.